when I get up in the morning, I know exactly what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be working. <sighs> they don't know what the works are actually going to be about, but they find their way. I was drawing and using colored inks and things like that. People in the neighborhood, the projects where I grew up in Bridgeport, Connecticut, they were telling me about this place called the ABCD Cultural Arts Center. And they said that, well, you have to go there because they have paints and canvases. And I said, wow, this is all this stuff for free. So once I made my way over to them, I ended up with these mentors, a fantastic group of artists who were just there helping kids. And I was one of them. My goodness. Just copying cartoons here. Just copied directly from television, like uh, whatever I was watching. I had the, the uh, facility to be able to do that at a young age, but at the same time, it wasn't original thought. Real fun. This is actually a, um, the, um, from the newspaper article when I was my first exhibition at age 13. And we used it as a flyer. And of course, these are much later. I was approached by DC Comics and Heavy Metal Magazine and Marvel Comics to, to do work for them. When I saw this black and white reproduction of Jackson Pollock's work when I was in the library in high school, that was it. And that was my first take on what fine art was. You can imagine Jackson Pollock when he's black and white, but it still, you know, elicited such a visceral response that when, when seeing it, I was kind of like, wow, this is amazing. And uh, from that point on, um, I began to question, you know, uh, what I was doing up against what I had seen and what I had felt, more actually what I had felt. Probably would have been like 15. I was still exhibiting a certain type of work, but it had touches of what I had realized. You know, when it came time for me to go to, uh, uh, to college, you know, it was pretty easy to sort of uh, uh, make a decision, like, okay, you just do college or you use your talents to sort of like uh, to go out and, you know, have a life or make money. And it's like, uh, it was pretty easy. You know, it was like, well, it's like uh, the, you go to the place where it's going to get you closer to, you know, the Jackson Pollock, you know. <laughs> I studied at Cooper Union. I was probably the greediest person there because I, um, I digested everything. I mean, I uh, was in, a, in the uh, foundry, the wood shop, you know, like making paper, um, uh, photography, and then I asked for an extra year. I had to fight for it, but they gave it to me. <laughs> My ability to be able to draw and paint well actually was getting in the way of me realizing something larger it's hard to get past something so beautifully done and then at the same time ask the uh, question, what's underneath that? But I decided it was time for me to stop using what I did well. So what I did was almost literally tied my hands. I said, okay, you can no longer paint or draw and you're gonna have to find another way to create. This is where I would have stopped drawing actually. This is where it ended. It was like seven years before I made a breakthrough. So like from 1980 to the 1989, to the uh, seven years of just experimenting, you know, this uh, piece came out, which was number eight. Animal parts, rope, a string, 
Everything that you can possibly imagine, is in, it's all entangled in this one monster of a piece. It was made up of all the failures, or at least what I uh, perceived as failures. If you're a number eight, then that means there's like one to, <laughs> one to seven that are no longer there. So it's like they were a part, all a part of number eight. One of the reasons why I actually number the works is to give the viewer enough room to find themselves in the work. The work should become a mirror. There are three areas on this piece of importance that I should pay attention to. So I can't place something here without knowing what's going on over there. So this tells this area what has to happen. And that tells this what has to happen. And that they speak to one another. So um, I know that there's a gradation going on, for instance. That has a sweep, you see, boom. And then it's a, you know, it just, by the time it, it, it reaches the bottom, this is the top, uh, it's going to be epic. <laughs> that way of uh, creating is actually only a microcosm of how I make things. Because when I'm working on this, I'm paying attention to that. And that's telling me what has to happen over here, too. And I can see things that are not working over there that I say, OK, make sure that that's not occurring here. And then this helps me by saying, oh, you know what? This needs that over there. You know? So a lot of times I can rip things out. That piece actually is already made up of at least four different pieces. Yeah. And the longer the work hangs around, the better off it is. My number is usually seven. I'm rotating seven things. They're speaking to each other. But it is sometimes like seven crying babies trying to get to this one, to that one, and they're bouncing around, and then they leave. I um, end up visiting these things in museums or people's homes, and on the whole, those people, those folks, or even security guards at museums end up knowing more about the works than I could have because they're living with them, and they've had longer, you know, much longer amount of time to sort of experience them. And I only have them for a second, you know? I remember making a piece in my apartment. Oh, at the time, I was living in Washington Heights. A friend of mine came over and said, well, how are you going to get it out? You know, I said, I hadn't thought of that. You know, I wasn't really thinking about it, taking a piece out of there, you know? I, I got smart enough to so at least break these things up into like uh, increments of 24 by 24 plates so that when I do hang it, you know, at least uh, if there was no help around, I could do it by myself. Being a person of color uh, is one of those things that, you know, you will have to contend with. As an artist, you're going to have to realize it um, and you're going to have something to say. When I actually did the show back in 1992, there were um, things that sort of came out of that exhibition, which I have not necessarily returned to, but they have definitely been things that people will probably continue to remember and write about, even if the work has absolutely, at this point, nothing to do with cotton or uh, ropes or things like that. There's a huge cotton wall piece that I had done. At the time, I was using a friend, uh, Jack Witten's studio. And I didn't have a car. I didn't have a license, my goodness. And Jack was living on Lisbonard, and I, which is behind Canal Street. I mean, I said, that's like a, it was some almost 30 blocks. <laughs> you know, so I was like, OK. I put the bale of cotton on the dolly and pushed it in the street. And I remember the photographs that came out from that. <laughs> Outrageous. For me, it was very practical to get you know, from A to B. But in fact, you know, if you look at the photographs, it's like, it's like a political statement. And then from there, it was like, okay, creating the piece. My people's history is not about just black people. It's like about all of us. I mean, there were things in that exhibition that, that went through my body that were huge. In 1992, I got it all out. It got said. For me to linger on that, it would be almost doing the art a disservice. I was there 11 years in a studio in San Antonio. I was always going back and forth from New York to San Antonio. One of the issues that has consistently come up when people write about the art is that they talk about found objects. Actually, I don't work with found objects. Most of my materials are actually created in the studio. 
So I actually go out and I buy material, brand new stuff. I actually become the weather. My reasons for having a studio in San Antonio had everything to do with the intensity of the heat and how I could actually weather some of the materials that I was working with. But what I ended up doing was like hoisting uh, onto the roof of the studio uh, these uh, uh, eight-foot cattle troughs, probably like uh, six of them, and I would cook the materials, you know, sometimes for uh, months and years, depending on what it is I was after. There's the uh, artwork that you physically make, but there's also the journey that happens on the inside. That body of work I was emotionally heavy, and, and I just thought, what would happen if you took that away? And here we are again with this uh, question. You're comfortable, how do I get to the next place? So you get rid of all the things that you're, you find that are comfortable. So I say, okay, get rid of uh, the rust. And it was at that point that the uh, Fabric Workshop had asked me to uh, come up with an idea for a piece as, as I was asking that question. I said, what if I took just white paper, uh, just like Xerox paper, you know, like really 16 pound paper, and it's like, okay, transform that, you know, into something. What if I took objects and I wrapped the uh, paper around them and then released them from the uh, objects? Boom, you take a razor blade, you cut it away, boom, take the object out, boom, put it back together. And there was nothing underneath the white paper, just the paper, so it's just a shell in the end, you know, so you're getting like, really, a ghost image. What happened was revealing. No matter what materials I end up using, once you find your voice, that's it. There is no escaping your past. With certainty, absolute certainty, I can look back on some of the configurations that I've created, and I can see those projects. I can see the landfills. We're right next to the dump. I mean, literally, we can see the dump from our window, and we can see the, uh, you know, the tractors going back and forth over the landfills. That was what I knew. I spent time at the dump. I can see the grid, for instance. Interesting enough, people go on like, oh, uh, his connections to minimalism. <laughs> I say, actually, it's more like those, <laughs> those gridded projects, you know what I mean? When you're creating, there are satisfying moments and then there are moments that are kind of like um, endpoints or, 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 or beginnings. My gallery approached me, what if we allowed you to take on the space? I had the space for a month to actually create in the space. And what I did was, as always, you know, bought materials like the wood and stuff like that and began to, you know, wash it and burn it and transform it. What we ended up with was this dilapidated wall. This thing was 109 feet long and monstrous. Just because something is big, bombastic, and, uh, and sensational does not necessarily mean that it's successful. I, it was like all of a sudden this, I had this epiphany. It is time for you to start reaching again. This is not quite enough. I know this too well, and I'm getting too comfortable again. Now, for the viewer, they can't know that. They can only know what you present to them.
I'm finding that the work is becoming like a monstrous sometimes in what it needs, and I just keep feeding it. The fact is, I've sort of almost set myself up in life so that I can give completely or commit completely to uh, this process of creating. I mean, I've never been married, I have no kids. I love kids, I love women, <laughs> but I don't have either, you know what I mean? So that tells you something about my commitment to like this, this life. We're all reaching. Like, uh, I mean, I'm not talking just about artists, but I mean, we all are reaching. As I'm creating, I know that I have the, the opportunity, whatever I, I feel or know I make into material. What a journey, though. I, I've enjoyed it for all of my life. And still, I'm intrigued. You know, I still want to reach out. I still want to reach. I still want to reach. I still want to reach. There's no other way of doing it except for this physical manifestation of what I have been through. And if I were to sort of like say what my work was, absolutely what my work was about, I couldn't tell you. And even if I knew, I probably wouldn't tell you. As I'm moving closer and closer to uh, answering questions, at the same time, I'm moving further away from the answers. So all I have to do at this point is I continue to sort of place my body in the act of attempting to know. To learn more about art in the 21st century and its educational resources, please visit us online at pbs.org slash art21. Art in the 21st Century is available on DVD. To order, visit shoppbs.org or call 1-800-PLAY-PBS.